Welcome to Services Marketing, the off-site edition. So, how this is going to work. This is the housekeeping slide. You'll get these on a few of the course, course pre-recordings as we roll through the semester. There are a couple of things that I want to say. And the first one is, this is not the ANU copyright notice. Dear God, no, it's not. This is pre-recorded content. The content and here is basically going to mostly parallel support and otherwise connect to the class. However, it is a self-directed learning asset. It won't replace the in-class experiences that we are creating for the semester. There are 12 weeks in a semester. There are 10 distinct in-class learning experiences that we have designed, have in mind. You can attend some, many, or all of these. You can attend zero of them. What I want you to do is to make a conscious choice as to how you choose to guide your learning in this subject. This entire course is built on the principle and premise of co-creation of value. What you put in is what you're going to get back. These slides are part of the self-service technology component. We have in the Wattle site embedded readings, PowerPoint summaries of the chapter, the access to the e-marketing textbook, which is a paid piece of content, but much like buying a video game so that your video console is useful, it is a cost that comes with the subject. These course recordings won't replace that face-to-face -face experience. However, because I respect the multi-stream pathway approach, I believe that services marketing should be able to be done as a self-service, technology-led, co-created, self-directed learning experience. So you can do the whole of the subject. I would recommend that you found ways and means to replace and substitute some of the uh, in-class activities we engage in, just simply because I think it'll make the subject just that little more fun for you. But also from the perspective of services is a living dynamic discipline. It's one of the areas of marketing that you can absolutely point to a theoretical framework and say, you are here. You are experiencing this as you are reading it, as you are watching it. This is a thing that's real and it occurs. So if you can't make the in-class activities or the exercises, Treat yourself to going out to a few uh, service events. Do your reading. Check the chapter out. Watch one of the videos. Go out and experience a service. Give yourself that you know, co-created, self-guided. So what we're going to cover in this particular slide deck is uh, the week one has a recap of marketing theory. It's in a separate video. Services marketing ethics in a separate video. And this is some of the fundamentals uh, and core concepts of services marketing. There is a little sort of take home exercise thing. It's not quite homework, but it's starting to use services marketing to see the world around you. And we'll get to that towards the end of the, uh, the presentation. So today, what are the outcomes for this video? Key services marketing theory that's present in the video. Now, I already mentioned one of the services marketing concepts, and that's self-service technology. There is an absolutely central model of services marketing, and this is the seduction model. It is important. There's no two ways about it. This model is in the course because the course was structured around using the model as our underlying framework. It's the overarching uh, philosophy of how the course is built. So it's a lived experience, it's a theoretical experience, and this is going to show up in everyone's assessment task. And because it's a real thing that describes the world as it is, I'm going to ask you to go out and do a little bit of field work on it. So let's get started. This is services marketing. Welcome aboard. What's a service? Now, the service is a subset of product. 
First and foremost, the one thing I will absolutely hammer people on is goods and services are opposite ends of a spectrum or paths along the spectrum. The product is the overall category that contains goods and services. Despite what the show's Showstack article that's on this very screen says it is not product marketing versus services marketing. Very, very clearly in my subject, it is not product versus service, and I don't care what it says on the screen. But the key thing is it's about the level of tangibility. On one end of the spectrum, goods are predominantly objects, devices, or things. The nature of goods-based marketing is that you are dealing with atoms. It is an object. It is an object that does something. It's an object that can be used for something, and the for some things are ownership, use, exchange. There are a range of different ways in which the object can be consumed. But fundamentally, it is an atom-based artifact that you are engaging with here. On the far end of the spectrum, on the other end of the spectrum, is the intangibility, which is the home ground of services. And these are deeds, efforts, or performances. Beyond services lies ideas and experience. So service isn't the far end of the spectrum in marketing overall. It's the far end of the spectrum in this subject. So basically, we're going to look at a waypoint here. It's a split between... The question you ask yourself is whether it's a good or a service is what's the primary outcome? Do you keep... Is the primary outcome to keep something? In which case, it's most likely goods. Is it a primary outcome going to be to change your personal state? It's most likely to be services. So there are sliding spectrums in between. If you take your car to a mechanic, your state won't change. The car state will change. You still keep your car. The primary role is the service. It's the application of skills. So you go to the uh, Autoco down at Tuggeron. You take your car in because you're going to use their skill set to fix, tune, upgrade, and generally uh, service your car. Lots of tangible tangible physical objects will be involved in the Autoco service, but you don't take ownership of the skills. You take ownership back of your car, you take ownership of the new oil they've put in there, you take ownership of replacement brake pads, but you don't, by putting your car into the mechanic, suddenly become a mechanic. You don't buy the skills, you don't take ownership. So the second distinguishing feature of a a service is the transfer of ownership of the core value. In the production of a product that is a good, you would expect the core value to be ownership. Despite what Apple and several other corporations are trying to do of hardware as service, but even that they admit it's hardware as service, software as service, once you take possession of an, an atoms-based object, ownership laws and rules of ownership take effect. When you go into a service, you don't get a transference of, you don't get to take ownership of the skills of the person who provide the service. So you go to see a movie, you walk out with the memory of the movie, you don't walk out with the movie itself. So there, there is a couple of like, distinguishing factors that make it important. Now, I want to raise a couple of things here, and that uh, services marketing is part of marketing. It is a specialist skill within the marketing framework, but it is absolutely 100% part of marketing. There's no versus marketing versus services marketing. Consequence of which is you're going to encounter theory you have seen elsewhere. When you get to services marketing, we are really interested in getting to understand how to make best use of what you already know. 
So here in the scale of market entities, um, that comes from the show stack paper that's in the textbook, the question of the difference between tangible dominant and intangible dominant brings up a theory, it brings up an idea from introduction to marketing. Back in the intro to marketing, you would have encountered in the product chapter the idea of the core, actual, and augmented product. So, again, same the molecular model inside the show stack, uh, also you can see in there that the marketing mix is getting a bit of a run in that particular model. But it's this idea that there is a core value and there is an actual product. The core value in a service is usually the receipt of experience or the receipt of a yeah, the value offers again because service dominant logic. The value offer on a product is quite often an artifact. The core is the solving of the problem. The actual is what form that problem solution takes. And in goods based marketing, it's usually physical. There's atoms involved. There are there's electrons involved somewhere, but there's also there are elements of service present. Um, the augmented quite often sees elements of service brought in to enhance the performance of the physical good. So the reason this separation matters is that you want, you get to make some decisions that make life easier for you once you've worked out. If I'm dealing with a physical object and a physical product, then I need to worry about inventory. If I'm dealing with a service, instead of worrying about inventory, I need to worry about throughput. I need to worry about process. I need to worry, in physical objects, manufacturing and stockpiling becomes the challenge. How do I make enough objects and put them through my distribution chain? In services, the question is the other way around. How do I put enough customers through my value creation capacity? How do I have enough people coming to my service so that my service is profitable but not overwhelmed. So separation becomes important. The other thing, um, other theoretical framework you're going to come back and see a lot in this subject is segmentation, targeting and positioning. And that came up in consumer behavior and that is one of the things that we were really trying to We've been really trying to push this over the last few years because of its importance as a practical business skill set. In services, targeting and positioning are absolutely mission critical. You can see it in the show stack model here that you are looking at physical, you're looking at the value offer, what does it cost, how is it distributed, and what is the market position for it? In When we're dealing with the atoms-based thing, we try and use market positioning to layer on the intangible. We layer on the intangible through advertising positioning, communication, and market positioning. On the intangible, on service delivery, we try and use market positioning towards proof of quality, evidence, and ease of understanding. So you're looking at a market positioning for a service as to particularly new services, being able to make them easily compared to something that already exists. So people can go, oh, this service, service X, it's like a physiotherapist meets a music hall. Don't ask me, I think it's dance therapy. Um, can't, but if you position strategy, it's like, well, it sits alongside uh, 24 hour gyms and drive through McDonald's. I mean, no one's built a 24 hour drive through gym to the best of my knowledge. For all of you who just paused the video to Google it, let me know in the comments below. Like, share, and subscribe. Sorry, I just had to get out of the system. The key thing though segmentation. It's an ethical problem and a business solution and a business problem and an ethical solution. 
it's both. It is the messiest thing that happens in marketing in services because market services marketing is heavily dependent on market segmentation and on putting the right combination of customers into the right environment. So these are frameworks that are going to recur. Segmentation is about to get its real time in the sun here in the theoretical frameworks because the seduction model, the central fundamental framework of services marketing in this semester is the concept of the interaction effects of the physical landscape environment, the service scape, the people who provide the service, the contact personnel, the infrastructure, including intellectual property, other service providing staff, the systems and processes, the almost invisible, sometimes visible, sometimes invisible back-end systems that support the, uh, that are the infrastructure of the service, and then the other customers. The ethics consideration here is that other customers are a part of the bundle of service benefits received by the customer. The customer, you as a student, come to the subject. Services marketing consists of a service scape, the teaching environment in which the classes are held. The contact personnel. Hi. The systems and processes, the wattle side, pre-recorded videos, the back end, the enrollment, timetabling, scheduling. When it comes to assessment, all the things that go on behind the scenes that you don't have to worry about, including things like turn it in, grade book, the wattle infrastructure, the access materials and access resources at the library, academic learning services. Canbury having food available when you need it, coffee shops. The whole system and process of the university is complex, dynamic, and massive. But you only really notice it when it doesn't work. But as a student, there's something else. That's the other students in the class. Whether it be a group assignment where you have to, your success is now tied with three partners who ha you have recruited from a pool of other people in the service subject through to when you are in a workshop environment, in a face-to-face -face environment, you are the other customer. You are providing part of the service experience of this subject to the people who are also providing the service experience to you. So simultaneously, you are going to be customer and other customer uh, it is a balance between, and this is, raises the ethical consideration as to what extent can we sell as a service provider, can we emphasize the other customer as a feature that you get access to by coming to a particular service? Nightclubs, let's be honest about this, Mooseheads absolutely sells the other customers as a feature set. Uh, Mooseheads has a service scape. It's very distinct. Uh, it's not remotely subtle, and it's there. There it has a service scape. It has systems and processes from the entire infrastructure required to make certain that when you order a drink, that drink is there to be sold. The contact personnel from the nice person in the black shirt with the number and letter name tag, security on the front gate, through to the staff inside, through to the people who sell, the people with the most amazing gift for lip reading and understanding what it is you are trying to shout over the music in a darkened environment full of blinky lights. Particularly hats off to every bar staff person who wears earplugs to work and can still work out what it is you're ordering when it's your fifth or sixth drink you're ordering it on. You've spent most of the evening shouting incoherently to your friends, and now you've gone to go and order something complex at the bar, and they get it right. Hats off to you, contact personnel. You're doing good work.
But central, central to this in the subduction model is the experience of a service is often determined by the experience of how of the other customers within that service. If you are going to a gym and you're going to an aerobics class, it's the aerobics instructor who's the contact personnel. It's the environment in which you are conducting your aerobics. It's the service scape. The class being scheduled, timing and all the other things, membership of the gym, systems and processes. But if you're doing something that requires another person to assist you, if you're doing a two-person exercise, we're selling you the other customers. We're selling... You go to a, an event, you go to the football, the crowd atmosphere, the ambience of the crowd is being sold to you as part of your ticketed experience. You are being sold and buying other customers. You're being sold as other customers and buying other customers. So there's a huge amount of stuff that we get to talk about in terms of ethics, business decisions, whole range of other things here around the efficacy, ethics, efficiency, and effectiveness of the other customer as part of the selection model. So, central though in this is the customer benefit. The whole nature of services marketing is we deal the intangible. The function model says that four factors influence the customer's perception of benefit. Benefit, for the purpose of this course, is value created minus costs incurred to access that value. You can have negative benefit. I mean that in the sense of costs can overwhelm value. And what's can be seen as a, you know, you're getting the thing out of the service that objectively the service was designed to provide. For example, you go to the Anytime Fitness Gym, you do your workouts, you're in a service scape, safe service scape, it's got all the safe machines, everything's right. The invisible systems let you in through the door, your, car, your swipe key works perfect. You're doing it during um, a staffed session, the contact personnel are there, they're helping. The other customers are friendly, people, um, you know, if you need to use the machine, they're making space for you, you're all working together, it's great, everything is objectively hitting the marks but you push yourself a little too hard in your co-creation value when you're doing your performance and you walk out and the following day you can't get out of bed because you are absolutely exhausted. You had a really good experience but you spent too much of your energy. You got a negative benefit. But this is the challenge. The cost, everything went right except for your own performance or the aftermath of your own performance. The cost of your own performance was higher than you expected. So you can have negative benefits. It's still fundamentally you hit all the marks of what the service was intending to provide. You just didn't get the value in a way that was useful. It may have been meaningful, but it wasn't as useful as it could have been. Now, the other thing to think about when it comes to benefit. This is where we start thinking about things like co-creation value, service dominant logic, um, the whole notion of what is value. It is a combination of people, experience, interaction, the physical place itself, the efficacy and efficiency of the systems, or if you're a bit of a systems geek, whether you actually get to see the systems, observe them, watch them doing their thing. Any restaurant that lets you watch the chef, any restaurant that does the uh, chef cooks at your table, and the sliding scale between the food arrives concealed in a box and this is also a thing you, you think about it. you go to GYG and your food arrives to you in a case in a little cardboard case you think about the price tag you think about the service scape you think about what a Gunsman and Gomez restaurant looks like you think about what you're paying 
and your food arrives in a box, concealed. You scale that up, so yeah, you, you're working your way through the camera center, uh, you head down to the Nando's, and the food arrives on the plate, it's visible, but you don't get to see it produced. You scale it up again, and you hit the sushi station, you can watch the sushi being made. You can custom order it and custom request it. Strangely enough, you can do that at the grill as well. You can pop in, order your hamburger, and supervise it being constructed. Meanwhile, at the subway, you have to supervise it because if you don't tell them the parts, they won't give you the salad. So, there is even interaction with the systems as a part of the customer benefits. That sense of control over what you're doing, the sense of control over your environment, those are facets that can be made useful value offers. So customer benefit, again, because we're dealing with the intangible, we're dealing also with the perceptual, what the customer perceives to be beneficial, what the customer perceives to be their experience is what governs that customer's reality. What they see it as is what it becomes. And that's another thing that's really important to understand is everything we're doing here is both intangible and perceptual. So in terms of uh, the key elements of the seduction model, organizations and systems, these are the rules, regulations, and processes. We will encounter them repeatedly throughout the course. Uh, probably their strongest uh, element is going to be in distribution. But also there is the part of the marketing mix that's called processes. That is the section that we deal with here. Other customers, again, this is one where there's going to be uh, a whole chapter set aside to the role of the customer in creating value in the service provision. Uh, but customers are also hold four traits. The active, active customer, passive customer, positive and negative. Now, there's a bunch of additional theoretical stuff that will come out of consumer behavior here. There's a couple of theoretical frameworks that getting your head around some of these concepts will be useful for you. So this is a little homework, um, co-creation value, search and research side. The theory is here, attention to social comparison information. This is the extent to which you look to the behavior of others to provide you with informational cues as to what you should be doing in a context. The higher you are on the attention to social comparison information, the more you need to draw down information from the actions of the people around you. It will slow down the speed to which you can engage in a service, but it will increase the level to which you will be mimicking the behaviors of the people in the room with you. It reduces risk in many aspects because it creates uh, social cohesion, you look to the left, you look to the right, you appreciate, oh, that's how it's done, or what this is my role here, I'll model that behavior. Reference groups, these are also uh, the aspects of uh, the person, the type of people you'd be looking up to, the behaviors you want to mimic and model. Normative pressure is different to attention social comparison information, but related. Attention social comparison information is an externally focused system. You look around to the information you can draw down from the people around you. Basically, this is your external uh, competitor analysis, external analysis for yourself. Normative pressure is your internal self-moderation. If there is one thing I will say as someone who has studied this area and did a PhD on uh, innovation adoption theory, cracking normative pressure is the biggest ace that you can have up your sleeve. Understanding the extent to which normative pressure is important to you helps you understand the level to which you're going to modify your own behavior based on what you assume other people are going to do in response. Now, the key thing to understand about a tutorial environment in any subject across ANU or anywhere is that a portion of the class are going to be thinking about themselves way more than they're ever thinking about you. 
So if you're about to self-moderate yourself by looking around the room going, oh, but if I ask this question, what will the other people in the room think about me? I can pretty much guarantee what's going to happen is that when you ask that question, they're all going to be going, wow, what would the people in the room think about me if I'd asked that question? They won't be thinking about you. They won't be applying social judgment to you. They'll be busy doing their own normative pressure filter. You get past that. It's a very liberating. So if you combine that with attention social comparison information, it's quite a liberating thing because you can now read a room and accurately respond to that room. Uh, other related concepts in the customer role is the role of peer pressure, the role of conformity, social confirmation bias, uh, everyone trying to do the right thing. The challenge here is that the customers can give themselves the satisfying, mediocre, non-desired outcome because they've assumed that oh, maybe the other people in the room want this. And if nobody actually stops to say, hey, do we all want lukewarm food? Or would we all like the food to be reheated? No one wants to make a fuss, everyone gets a bad experience. Someone makes the fuss, everyone gets a good experience. There are challenges. Now where these become particularly uh, apparent, attention to social comparison information is heavily used in hospitality and catering. It's used in restaurants. It's used to help guide people into decision-making processes. Uh, the normative pressure, the internal self-moderation, self-filtration comes out really strongly where you are dealing with skill-based um, encounters. The challenge is also where you go to somewhere like a skill-based service that requires your honesty for the co-creation of the service. So you go to a doctor and the doctor asks you questions about your health and they're like, so how are you feeling? Attention, social comparison information, reference groups, politeness, peer pressure, normative outcomes, all want you to go and say, fine, thanks. It's like, that's not why you were there. If you were fine, thanks, you wouldn't be at the doctor's. So where you have to do self-disclosure self in order to access the parts and the features of the service, it's vitally important. But also you'll find that when that's really a central important aspect that they will remove other customers from the equation to try and take out some of these external pressure modification behaviors. Finally, on the other customers thing, uh, the little two by two matrix here, the positive, active positive contributions to the experience. Being in a room with this customer has made the experience better. The passive positive experience, sorry, active positive experience is when the actions of that other customer has made your service experience better. Let's take Mooseheads, you can figure it out for yourself. Let's take uh, going out to see the Raiders at, uh, you know, go watch the NRL, go to a Raiders game, the people next year in full Raiders gear and they are cheering and they're explaining the rules and they're co running commentary on the event and they are just like a really fun group of people to hang out with and you're learning about the game and you're getting hyped up with them active, positive engagement in the experience. Passive is where mere presence. You go to a, go to a music, go to a concert, and it's jam-packed, then there's going to be a lot of, there'll be some positive active, but there'll also be the fact that there's just so many people there. It's great. You feel that you're at the right place. Active positive is a really, uh, it's one where we often have to provide incentives. Passive positive is presence of the others, that you're not alone here, you're not alone in the experience. Um, if you ever sat, if you and three other people have sat in a large lecture hall that takes 250 people and just six of you showing up and three of you are all sitting in the back corner near the door together, that's the passive, po passive positive is the two people next to you so a sense of, all right, we're in this together. Active negative is where there is a conflict between the needs and wants of two different customer groups. We do come across this a lot, but this is also where segmentation becomes important. There's the customer you want and the customer you don't want. And there's the customer your customer wants and the customer your customer does not want. It's where the ethics become challenging. It's where there are problems. 
Negative passive is that the mere presence of another causes, and it's like mere presence of another creates some normative pressure or tension set, ocean comparison, information pressure. So you walk, you have that moment of you walk into a restaurant and you're not dressed like everyone else in the restaurant. Passive negative other customer you could be ruining the tone of the neighborhood for the other customers. You could be that problem. Or you could feel unwelcome and uncomfortable there. There is nothing anyone else in the room has said or done. They haven't even so much as looked up from the menu. But you feel awkward. It's a passive negative response to the other customers. So you're, in the, you're the wrong market segment for the environment. So there's some self-selection in the segmentation thing as well. Contact personnel, the people who provide the service. Hey, uh, there's also the people who engage briefly. Uh, so for those of you who have had any dealings with the CBE office, when uh, if you came out to open day and you met some of our marketing staff, they were or you had a problem, you needed to get. Uh, help from CBE office on the first floor of uh, ANU CBE 26. There's also elements of um, the process where you are engaging people at Canberra, you're uh, encountering ANU security, you catch a bus, the ANU security bus, or there are a whole bunch of other people whose roles aren't necessarily directly to facilitate the service, but they have an impact on your satisfaction with the service. There's also in the service provision, there are the primary providers, uh, and we have this idea of the boundary spanning role, where the, pri the primary provider of a service, a skills-based service, has two separate responsibilities that sometimes conflict. We go into this into a lot of depth later, but surface level, if your job is to make the customer satisfied and your job is to make a profit, there are points where there can be clashes between the two requirements and the clashes quite often, though they create role stress, they create problems, we do go over it and engage it because it's a really important factor. But we also will see this, the contact, like the personnel side, the role of people in services, services are skill-based, deeds-based, experience-based, people are a core part of the service product delivery, which also flags an ethical consideration of to what extent are you selling the service or selling the person? Are you selling access to a person or are you selling access to a service? Which is the right one to do? Which is the morally reprehensible approach? Which is the morally responsible approach? Which is the profitable approach? Which is the optimal approach? Service gate, physical environment. This is a big one. Uh, this is going to also, this is the you are here moment of most of the time. If you're listening, well, since you are listening to this, stop and take stock for a second. Like quite literally look to the left, look to the right, look at the area around the screen that you are currently using this on. How does this physical landscape that you are in impact the way in which you consume this recording. Welcome to You Are Here of Services Marketing. Lecture theatres, the Murray Ray room, the Cambry rooms, all the rooms in the Murray Ray, the rooms in ANU CBE 26. What is the environment? How does the environment package the service? How does it shape and facilitate the service? If you're standing in a room that basically is designed to be used for broadcast, for talking loudly at people on mass, how does that work to try and facilitate alternate modes, alternative deliveries? The other thing that uh, the service gate does, and the ANU does not do very well, it's something I get you to pay attention to. Look for the logos within the ANU environment. Look to the extent to which we brand inside the classrooms. Look for the quality cues, the metric cues of where am I 
Then go to McDonald's or Nando's or GYG or any of the major food chains. Walk through Target, walk through Kmart. Look to see the extent to which the brands of the organization are present within the service scape that you are consuming. Because this is a really interesting factor of packaging, branding, and differentiating. So ServiceScape's going to come in, it gets its own chapter, but it's also one that I want, it's the one that's, uh, when you get good at this theory, when you understand this theory, you can see it in operation. So it does mess with you a little bit. Uh, it's kind of peels back some of the layer. Um, so you can see the wires, you can see the cross, how it works. Um, I jokingly, because you know, being as I am old and the Matrix is 20 years old, happy birthday, Matrix. Uh, I refer to that scene in the back of the Matrix, uh, first movie, where Neo can see the code. Getting really good at service scape, it doesn't turn everything into green um, kanji and emoticons, but it does give you a sense of, oh, that's how this is working as well so for some extent it is actually there's like bonus level of informatic over you walk into this environment it's like this is awesome this is amazing this is also really well done uh, so there's a it brings a cognitive level to the experience of a service scape uh my apologies if you didn't want this to happen it happens once you start studying services marketing so the final uh the take-home exercise off the back of this video so this is a if you're coming to the classes, some of these take-home exercises will be de debugged, debriefed, and discussed during the face-to-face uh, -face environments. But I'm still going to pose the question because this is self-directed, self-guided learning. This is about you going and doing the thing and seeing how it works. Seduction plus other customers. Well, seduction field test. So we've got this theoretical framework, the seduction. We've got service scope, physical environment. And we've got other customers. Now, if you're going to classes, if you're attending other people's face-to-face -face classes, I want you to think about how does the physical environment of the lecture theatre influence the way in which you engage with other students? Just look at it, engage it, think about it, experience it. Bonus, if you're not going to the classes and you're just doing this online, how would you replicate a service scape. How would you create a location that allowed you to interact with other students whilst consuming this video? How would you do it? What what how would you make use of a physical environment to do that? Third option on that is go catch yourself the uh, light rail from top to tail. Get on a Linga Street, head down the ride, look at the way that the dynamic changes and okay. do a couple of the, the tram trips on different times look at the interplay between the physical environment of the stations the interplay of how people respond and interact and engage or disengage with each other as the service gate changes as you move through the environment the number of people on the tram the way in which they're positioned look at that in terms of that's your your field test. How is this dynamic facilitated? And what is it facilitating? So the recap, uh, what the slides, what the video has run you through is the seduction model is the framework for the course. It's the theoretical, conceptual underpinning of the course, but it's also what it is that we're going to use to guide how we engage the content and the subject this semester. Uh, what I'd like you to be able to do, obviously, is I'd love you to be able to start using the seduction model as your thinking filter to be able to go, this is what is happening in this environment, and uh, knowing its core components. This is one of the points where I always believe very strongly that I, it's better to be able to apply something than to be able to just simply memorize it and recall it. But in order to apply it, it does help to know it, so that means learning it understanding what the words, what each of those four boxes then represents in terms of access to a wider set of knowledge and theory. Servicescape is 
the summary overarching element, there is a lot of content underneath ServiceScape. Same for other customers. There's a lot of stuff under there, segmentation, targeting, positioning, consumer behavior, even role conflict and role stress. So these all have subcomponents, but the top is the five elements, the value sought by the customer, and how that is influenced through ServiceScape, systems, other customers, and the service provider. So, any questions about the content here, you can hit me up on Twitter, like, share, and subscribe. Uh, feel free to email questions through. Doing questions in writing is useful because it creates a certain tangible um, digital paper trail for us. If I get a lot of questions around the content area, I will do additional material. I will come back and support. So if there's something you want to know or need to know, please feel free to ask because then I can help you. And that's a wrap for the week one video recap.